All right. Good evening and welcome to tonight's program presented jointly by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library and the International Spy Museum. I am Rosie Waniak, Public Programs Coordinator at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. We thank you for being with us this evening. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library and the Spy Museum share strong educational missions. The International Spy Museum's mission is to educate the public about espionage and intelligence in an engaging way and to provide a context for understanding the important role intelligence has played in history and continues to play today. And they are committed to the apolitical presentation of espionage in order to provide visitors with impartial, accurate information. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library is centered around our mission to increase the public's understanding of military history, military affairs, and national security, as well as how military service and the sacrifices made by the men and women who have worn the uniform have shaped our country's democracy. We are delighted that the missions of these two organizations have aligned to make tonight's program possible. In this webinar format, you are invited to post relevant questions or comments in the Q&A feed, and we will do our best to address them. This program is being recorded and will be available for streaming soon on both the PMML website and the Spy Museum YouTube channel. Aiva Toguri was visiting Japan from her home in the United States when Pearl Harbor was attacked in 1941. Trapped in Japan, she was pressed to renounce her American citizenship but she refused. As war raged across the Pacific, Toguri took a job with Radio Tokyo, where she was forced to host Zero Hour, a propaganda show aimed at demoralizing American troops. Tokyo Rose, Zero Hour, a Japanese American woman's persecution and ultimate redemption after World War II, is a riveting graphic novel that tells the true story of this much maligned woman. With us this evening to talk about this incredible woman, are the creators of Tokyo Rose Zero Hour. Here to introduce each of our wonderful speakers and moderate tonight's panel is the Spy Museum's Director of Adult Education, Amanda Olka. Amanda? Hi, thank you so much, Rosie, and, and thank you to the Pritzker Foundation. And of course, we love partnering with our, our friends at the Pritzker Museum and Memorial Library. Um, it's incredible to be here to talk about this book uh, this evening. And our panel tonight includes Andre Fratino, and he is the author of the book. And he has written several graphic novels, including the 2018 Florida Book Award winner, A Land Remembered, Kate Casanow, the artist behind the incredible image in the book, has worked on an array of published graphic novels from crime noir to slice of life, including form of a question. And then last but certainly not least, we have Janice Chang, the very esteemed letterer of, of this graphic novel. And she has worked for those comic book fans out there. She has worked with Marvel and Storm King and DC Comics, Scholastic and Dark Horse and many more. Now, Rosie gave you some good background on, um, on Eva Tagora, but I wanted to share a little bit. I, dug deep into the Spy Museum archives, because I know we talked about Tokyo Rose in our museum when we opened in 2002, and I was a little bit scared about what I would find, because now that I have read this novel, I am so incredibly uh, just heartbroken and, uh, and inspired by, um, by her true story. And so we have an image of the real lady, the real woman, uh, and there she is being interviewed by the press in September 1945. And here is the short label copy from the original, old original spy museum. The myth of Tokyo Rose. Tokyo Rose was his name given to various women who broadcast anti-American propaganda for Radio Tokyo. 
They told morale damaging tales of unfaithful sweethearts and bogus casualty figures. Meanwhile, an American born employee named Iva Tagori in Tokyo to care for an ailing aunt dreamed of returning home to California. But when she did, it was as a war prisoner. Tagori was falsely accused and convicted of being the Tokyo Rose. She served six years in prison, finally receiving a presidential pardon in 1976. So I, I felt good about our label. We did not dump on this poor, much maligned woman, but better than any label is an incredible graphic novel. And I think we have an image that shows you a little bit of what it looks like inside. As I kick it over um, at first to the panel, and I'm hoping that you will talk about what this project meant to you. How did you approach it? How did it come to be? Yeah, well, you know, thanks. Uh, first, I want to just thank both the Pritzker and the International Spy Museum for, you know, inviting us here tonight. It's uh, fantastic. It's quite an honor. Um, you know, the, the moment of when I can say that I materialized Tokyo Rose as a graphic novel, I, I'm at a loss. It's one of those books that just kind of, it wasn't in my mind and then it was in my mind. Um, but wherever I had heard about it, I think what really... Um, excited me about this story was just the crucible that Iva had gone through. You know, she was a UCLA student, you know, she was, um, you know, a Jimmy Stewart fan, you know, she had friends, she played tennis, she completed a, a degree, she was looking, you know, to continue on in her life like many young adults do today. Um, and then by no fate of her own was asked by her parents to go to Japan, which she had no connection with, um, you know, take care of an ailing aunt who was her mother's twin, actually. And um, and then didn't make it back in time before December 7th. So, um, you know, she fought throughout the war on her own terms. And I think that um, unfortunately, at the end, despite her, you know, fervent, you know, American pride, um, you know, ended up being in the crosshairs of two different countries at war and then having to deal with a lot of persecution following the war. So, um, you know, I saw that there was a lot of the American spirit in that and a lot of, um, you know, uh, an opportunity to tell a tale about somebody who, in many, in my opinion, at least, is, is quite a fascinating character for World War II. We're always usually looking at militaristic people uh, during that war, but it's important to remember that there were quite a few uh, civilians who fought in it in different ways or participated in it in different ways. And then um, for somebody like Iva to have to undergo a war after a war and still manage to keep her spirit is quite an indomitable accomplishment. Yeah, and from the moment that Andre first told me about Iva's story, at first, I almost couldn't believe it that that story could have really happened um, until he like showed me the material himself. And once he did, once he put the idea in his head, like he said, he's not sure when it materialized, but once it was in his head, he couldn't get it out. And I felt the exact same way. Once he told me about it, I was like, this is a project that would be really, really awesome to be a part of. Um, and you know, to tell that story to other people and to share, you know, in that part of history was a really cool experience for me. Um, and of course, working with with Andre was really great because we'd known each other for so long, but had never managed to work on a project together. So in our industry in comics, you know, working on projects together with people you know is one of the best experiences you can have. Um, so it was it was not only a really important story to tell, but it was a really great experience for me to be a part of overall. So the strength of um, the research that Andre had done and the images that Kate had created to tell the story, for me, it was very personal. I was finally seeing an unwritten chapter of history being written. And, you know, it's like, um, I think as long as the story is told well, we need to t tell it. You know, it's not specific just to a group of people to, yeah, we defend our own history and we have to promote it. 
But at this point, you know, it's about unity. You get the best talents to work together. And being in the industry, that's how we make our comic teams, no matter what company you work with. It's like, who's gonna come through? Who do you trust? Who's going to deliver? So I was happy, you know, honored to be able to write the foreword to, you know, share my experiences as an Asian American woman in this country. Cause I knew, I knew Eva's story a long time ago because, uh, you know, with the Chinese immigration history, uh, we were kidnapped, brought over to build a transcontinental railroad. And uh, after it was completed, there was like a recession. So uh, the way it turned out was immigrants were fighting immigrants for jobs. So uh, 1882, a Chinese Exclusion Act was put in effect. And unless you could prove that you had relatives that were in the country before then, you could not immigrate. So what happened, you know, families would sponsor members to come over. And the kicker was we weren't allowed to bring women over to start families because they did not want us to put roots down. So a lot of times the guys would come over to earn their living either in Mexico, uh, in the United States, Canada, you know, around the world. And they would go home and start families and then leave again. So, you know, it was a difficult life, but one thing, <laughs> we persevere. <laughs> That's like I say, we persevere and find a way. <laughs> anyway, you know, so it, it was great because, you know, growing up during um, the Cold War era, you know, I was born in 1955. You know, at that time, China was the enemy of this country. So depending on what period of the country, you know, about American history, China would be the enemy or an ally. So, you know, it's like recently with the a COVID pandemic, uh, you know, the former president, you know, pinpointed that we <laughs> were contagions or we were carrying the disease. That like kicked up again. You know, so every time I leave my house, it's like, okay, who are we going to confront today? And, you know, it's like, um, what we do learn is like, there's always kind people. Not everybody's like, not, not kind. So that's all I want to say. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to, I have questions that really relate to the spy content and the military comment. But since, um, Janice, since you brought that up, in looking at the book, you made it, very clear that you had assembled all sorts of people to review this story. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you gathered together the team to kind of review the book, make sure you were getting the history right, make sure you were getting the sensitivities right, the cultural representations correct? Andre. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was a question geared towards Janice. But yeah. <laughs> Janice just Janice just pushed me in that. But you anyway, can answer. So um, I was looking at my notes to make sure I could be prepared to answer some of these questions. But um, a lot of when dealing with sensitive topics or sensitive historical information, I like to see myself as a history focused graphic novelist. So my approach to telling these graphic novels is to make it both entertaining and educational. But I do really try and make sure that we get to the closest original facts as we can. Surprisingly, um, Ivan Degori's story is not really told through that many documentations. I think in total, I found maybe three or four books that actually focus on her. I mean, good books, good, um, you know, factual documentation. And for the most part, many of them either vindicate Iva's story and, and vindicate her, or they stay pretty neutral to what, you know, her experience was there. But um, the hard, tricky part was to take these different interpretations and then try and find a way to actualize it where the visuals really tell the narrative and the story. Um, but, um, you know, one of the books was very heavy on to the court cases. The other books were more on her day-to-day -day life and all the different characters involved. And the third one was definitely across essentially the whole geopolitical uh, genre. So a lot of that factual information makes it into the book, but I paired it very well with trying to balance the narrative of this young woman and taking it from her point of view. Obviously, I'm you know not a young woman, nor am I you know Asian American, <laughs> but I think you know what I see myself in this role is to be a steward for the story. It's definitely not my story. But it's the idea of trying to tell this in a way that's respectful 
that enables people to learn about this history through her eyes. And then hopefully my goal with all my historical graphic novels is that it will lead you to then go and do your own research. Um, and that's kind of what I was hoping would be the outcome with this, is that people would take this information and see it as a stepping stone to learning more about IVA on their own. Well, I have to say, people who come to a lot of our programs may be aware that I got my hair done this morning, and I was, the, the hairstyle, everybody was riveted. They were like, what are you doing tonight? Why are you here in the morning? And I was telling them her story because it is so richly told in the graphic novel. And and Kate, so much of you have gotten so much energy into this. How do you get this much energy? Because I keyed into Andre saying we have a young woman and you get that youthful energy. How do you capture that? And then I promise I will get back to propaganda questions. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, much like Andre talked about doing a lot of the written research, I mean, there's a lot of visual research that I have to do as well, just to make sure, I mean, not only for the time period that the story is set in, but just for like the characters themselves, not necessarily trying to get, you know, a perfect picturesque likeness, but really trying to create a character that people can identify with and someone they can recognize sort of easily as they turn through the pages of the book. So creating like char like little character Bibles for myself, you know, really helped to make sure that I'm maintaining Iva's presence, you know, as a character in this story, in her story um, throughout the book. And once, you know, once you start doing that, the nice thing about working on a longer project like this is once you start doing that, you kind of like just get into it. <laughs> like there's a flow to creating, you know, to creating those images um, as you're telling a visual story. And Andre certainly did a great job with the research and a great job with the writing. Um, you know, the story is written beautifully, but what I really love about working with someone I know is that, like he was saying, he also kind of knows when to leave space for the visual story instead of just writing it down. Because I mean, if you wanted to read like a prose book, like a historical prose book, you would do that. But you're reading a graphic novel to really like see the visceral physical story. Um, and so yeah, Andre... I wonder if I can, <laughs> you know, we've got just some yeah. great, just there's beautiful lettering. Yeah. And, and what's so important in this story, the radio. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Yeah. So Andre really knew when to leave space for just visual storytelling. There are lots of pages in the story that you could pick out that actually don't really have that many letters on them. Um, but they tell the story just as effectively as, you know, when the beautiful lettering from Janice comes onto the page as well. Well, what I've learned with um, the role of comic lettering is a silent soundtrack. It's sort of like um, filmmaking. You know, um, you have the scenes close up, you know, distance, establishing shots. And you always have to be aware of the light source also. So I try not to, <laughs> if literally there's a lamp, you know, hanging there, I do not cover it. Because, you know, Kate has designed it so that it'll be a wash with the light in that certain direction. So my job as a letterer is to tell the story, the written part, and preserve the visual storytelling. So, you know, be, being that I have a background in fine arts and graphic design, you need the art I've studied, you know, it's like copper plate etching, you know, silk screen, photo, stencil, <laughs> you name it, I've done it. So I'm very sensitive to what the artist put da puts down, you know, designs, because I know what it takes to do that. So I feel it's, it's my responsibility to the written story and the visual storytelling to have the flow where the reader can follow and not get lost. Because what I really want them to do is like, look at the visuals, read the story and go back and forth. Every time they cycle around, like reading it twice or the third time, they'll pick up something new through the experience. And the content of Tokyo Rose, you know, not only the historical part, Andre, but I want people to change their hearts and minds. Because Kate and you and I are trying to demystify what a Japanese person is. And basically, they're like you and me, everyday people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've gone through a really divisive period of history and it's still continuing. So it is our obligation to demystify what we don't understand. And, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs>
they really, you know, uh, in looking, there are not a ton of photos of her, but there's certainly photos of her, and we shared one. It looks very much, you really captured, you know, her look and her appearance. And we'll get, I'll get back into some soft questions again later, and we'll open up to the audience, but I will now return to the questions that I, that I sent in advance. Um, so Radio Tokyo, who she is really coerced into broadcasting for, was a product of the 8th Section G2 of the Japanese Imperial Army. And that section was responsible for psychological warfare. This is a complicated story about propaganda and people working for Radio Tokyo, creating content and they're actually working against Radio Tokyo's mission to demoralize the troops of the allies. allies. How do you research that? How do you convey that? Let me tell you, I had a difficult time um, explaining that at the beauty salon this morning, but <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> well, let me start by saying that, you know, let's take a history lesson from this quickly. I was started off um, as a part-time typist um, for the administrative section of the American Division of the Overseas Bureau of NHK, which stands for Nippon Hoso Kyoke. Um, and forgive me if my Japanese is, is slightly horrible, but um, she was, it's essentially was an English Japanese broadcaster uh, corporation. And initially, a lot of the propaganda was split between both the military and then um, the uh, foreign ministry and the government. So there was a lot of different organizations kind of working on their own individual propaganda. Um, and then what eventually happened was they realized we all need to get on the same page. We're, we're kind of working against each other. So they designated something called the Information Liaison Conference Committee, which was formed to oversee all of the Japanese propaganda activities. Uh, and it consisted of various branches of the Japanese government, military, uh, which ultimately ended up with the army taking over control, which was the 8th Section G2. Um, Major uh, Shigetsugu uh, Suneshi was you know, put in charge of the division, had very limited experience within propaganda, uh, but he focused a lot majority wise at the beginning on print content. So leaflets, magazines aimed towards allied forces that they would drop over or distribute. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, this is where it gets kind of comical, but I think when it comes to propaganda in any country that tries to do it, you really have to look outside the box and try a lot of different things in psychological warfare. So, you know, without ruining a lot of what you read in the book, you know, there's a lot of interesting ways that they came up with trying to, you know, uh, demoralize the uh, allied troops. But, you know, some of it was kind of, a, you know, displaying women, being longing and wanting to have their husbands back and being, you know, in promiscuous oh, relationships. Okay. And others were kind of focused on the more... Um, uh, mystical as aspects of warfare that were attuned to Japanese culture that the American and allied troops wouldn't understand. But um, ultimately, it did lead towards um, radio broadcast, which at those times was really the most advanced uh, form of broadcast you had. There was no television, there was no internet, you know, people couldn't watch YouTube, you couldn't, you know, tune into, you know, a news network. So, um, distribution through radio broadcast was their main way. And, um, you know, it, it didn't really work out at the beginning. Sure, you had, you know, Japanese English speakers, but what they were looking for was somebody who could be the mouthpiece that would enlist or entice the American and allied troops to actually, you know, start to feel something about the war in a negative light. And that's kind of what ends up uh, formulating into the zero hour. Um, but it was, it was definitely one of the more interesting aspects that I was really glad we were able to put into this book because, you know, it really goes to show just how the Japanese military was viewing the Allied forces and what they were trying to do to, um, you know, get them to work against themselves. Yeah, that was one of my favorite, some of my favorite sequences to illustrate in the book is because, um, you know, even though they're kind of less personal, you get this really vast 
interesting viewpoint of like the multiple layers you get like sort of the Japanese military side of what they were thinking that they wanted and then how they put that into action and then how it was actually received by American military forces and being able to like draw so many of those different sequences throughout the book and show them to people so you see how complicated the layers of like action and reception actually occur was was really fascinating to me and i and i mean i have a lot of fun just creating lots of different characters reacting to things <laughs> but being able to show like the propaganda wheel kind of actually happening like visually was was a really really interesting part of the story for me i, I think that's a good example of how any situation is not black or white, it's multi-layered. There's so many things going at one time and you know, depending what you are uh, privy to is your perception of your conclusion. So that was really great, Kate, about the storytelling. <laughs> There's a lot that's made about her voice in particular and why it so felt friendlier or something. Did you have any opinions on that? Any of you as just fans of the story? Well, I think, I mean, with Iva herself, she was an American. She was proudly American, you know, and she just happened, she just sort of happened to be stuck in Japan at the wrong time. Um, so she herself was a unique individual in that country in in that city and in that circumstance so um so even though we're producing kind of a visual medium that you read you don't actually get to hear her voice um we make a big deal of that in the story just to emphasize like how like how this person was so unique in the grand scheme of things she's just one person who just like i said was kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time but that led to this incredible sequence of events um and that and that's you know the fact that she made the most out of that the way she did is incredible yeah there are a lot of archive footage of of iva's broadcasts and in fact after the war iva did a sort of mock like here's an example of what one of my broadcasts were like and you can go online and I find them on most different social media sites. I think YouTube has some videos. Uh, but through my research, I'm, I'm actually going to let, um, I'm going to quote two different lines I discovered um, exactly why they chose Iva for this role. And um, it's actually, uh, one quote comes from uh, Major Charles Cousins, who's a character in our book. He's the um, Australian um, officer who essentially uh, oversaw the zero hour. And uh, in his own words, this quote says, uh, with the idea that I had in mind of making a complete burlesque of the program, her voice was just what I wanted, rough. I hope I can say this without offense, a voice that, have, that I have described as a gin fog voice. It was rough, almost masculine, and anything but femininely seductive. Um, it was a comedy voice that I needed for this particular job. So kind of a really like slap in the face, kind of a rough response. But Iva's response to this actually, because Iva, you know, had her own words as to why um, they chose her for this role. She goes, Major Cousin said, my voice is not what you call a gentle and sweet voice, but he wanted a Yankee voice with a certain personality, uh, personality to it, with a little touch of a walk officer's voice. And that stands for Women's Army Corps. Um, in it that would have a lot of cheer. So after having read both those quotes, you know, it was kind of a typical sort of like Australian, I mean, I can't want to say Australian officer, but it was kind of a typical allied forces officer of thinking analytically about this woman doesn't have a voice we're looking for, this woman has the voice we're looking for, it doesn't sound sexy. But then like Iva's response to being just, it's kind of how I've researched all of Iva's responses to everything that she's done through. Like she's very matter of fact about herself, but she's very understanding. She's never once kind of ever, at least publicly, ever conveyed any sense of, of embarrassment or shyness about everything. Like she's very much like, yeah, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what they want. This is what I like. This is what I'm doing. So. I kind of appreciate that about her, that she definitely knows who she is, which again goes to the whole reason why I think that this story was so 
um, worth pursuing um, because for somebody in the 1940s, a woman from uh, you know an Asian American background to be just so unabashedly confident of herself and everything she does um, just speaks uh, volumes for what she really was able to transform the zero hour into. Well, she sounds fun. <laughs> I've got to say, when I listen to it, you feel like you're, you can get up to something with her, you know? So it really, it, it is, I highly recommend folks giving, search it out, give her a listen. Um, so you did mention Major Charles Cousin, um, Charles Cousins, and how, how did he get this opportunity to subvert Radio Tokyo? Uh, so before the war, Charles Cousins was a Australian radio broadcaster and television presenter. So I probably would say, think of him kind of like the Australian version of Ryan Seacrest or Tom Bergeron. Uh, and what happened was he obviously joined the war like many others and uh, was posted uh, in Singapore. And he was there when, the Sing when Singapore fell and was captured uh, by Japanese forces and uh, who did not know who he was at the time, but through another POW, it was revealed to the Japanese that he was a radio broadcaster. So they actually took him from his prison in Burma and um, brought him to Japan for the express use of employing him within radio propaganda, which is what Taneshi, you know, approaches him with in the book. Uh, and, you know, like Iva, he did, uh, do some of the presentations, his voice is heard. When his wife first heard his voice, she was disheartened that he would do anything against, you know, Australia and the Allies. Uh, and, you know, immediately following the war, and, and you know, he was, uh, uh, an order for his arrest was put out by General MacArthur. He was arrested. He was taken back to Australia to, um, to undergo, you know, essentially uh, a, a court case against him. He was stripped of all of his uh, commission and, uh, you know, continued on essentially to try and help Iva uh, earn her own freedom. Uh, so, you know, I think in his position, he was kind of put in a place that he really had no choice. I mean, to, the, to his dying day, he pretty much conveyed that, you know, what he was doing was to circumvent the, you know, propaganda. But, uh, you know, it definitely um, put a, a, a kibosh on his career. Yeah. Now, we've talked ab about her voice, which was one of the things that made her broadcast so different. And this is, is really hard to convey. But are there are there other things that um, you all feel like from researching it made hers turn out to be positive to the allies listening as as opposed to morale busting? Well, I think one thing Andre tried to do a lot was kind of how uh, I mentioned earlier is tried to show some of the reaction, like the, the potential reaction that her broadcast would receive like in real time, um, you know, how the military listening might hear it and like hear that voice that we were just talking about, you know, and, and think like, is it like, what is this? Cause this is funny. Like, I like this, you know, so showing the more, jovial reactions or reception to um to her broadcast was something that Andre felt very strongly about including and and I think it goes well to kind of show um even if you're reading the text and like again you can't hear it when you're reading the graphic novel but like even if you're reading it and you're like these words are kind of mean but you see the reaction of people interpreting tone um, you know, and, and showing that visually, I think it was an important way to show the, you know, how those broadcasts were really different as well. She, uh, she really fell into a trap, but we'll, we'll talk about, well, maybe we should talk about that now before the next question. Um, or I'll bundle them because she kind of falls for an opportunity to give an interview on Tokyo Rose, you know, to start a new life or, or start a life with her husband, get, get some money from an interview. And that is just so hard to believe how that all unfolded. And I, how did you all feel reading about it, researching it, that, that this agreeing to do this interview then lands her in jail? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, she, 
had already been stuck in Japan for so long. And, um, you know, when the notice was put out for they were searching for Tokyo Rose, the, uh, the reporters, you know, a lot of other people um, kind of avoided it, you know, because they knew. I mean, the thing about Tokyo Rose is that she was Iva Degori, also known as, you know, Orphan Anne was really her broadcast name. She was not the only, you know, um, uh, speaker. So there were a number of other Tokyo Roses that could have come forward. But, you know, for the most part, I was I was the one that took the offer because she desperately wanted to get home. And the money that was going to afford it from this interview with, uh, you know, uh, Bainbridge was going to allow her to get back to her family. Who she had not heard or seen in forever and, and was also not aware of what was going on in the internment camps. Um, so, you know, the thing was with it is she kind of painted herself into a corner and essentially initiated that without her knowledge. Um, and because what happened, you know, with the, uh, the news reports and they weren't able to actually use it, they instead decided to, you know, I don't want to give away too much because you all should read this book, but, um, you know, <laughs> The thing was, is that it, it all came from a sense of just where we would all want to be. We'd all want to get home to our families post-war. And Iva inadvertently had kind of put herself um, in jeopardy. But, um, you know, it's, it's again, speaks to that humanity level of Iva and who she is. And, um, you know, just the series of unfortunate events that unfold from there. Um, and so what happened to her is is so harsh. But what do you think is important for people to understand about how she coped with being convicted as a traitor? Her, and then she's imprisoned. She, I don't think we're going to spoil. I think people are going to read this anyway. You know, she loses her husband. I mean, they've got to read this. They got to find out all these details. You know, I mean, it's just, it's so tragic. You know, she loses her family, her chance to be a mom. And how did she cope with that? And and then afterwards, she's so inspiring. I, I wish you all would comment on, I don't understand how she stayed so positive. Yeah, um, you know, it's uh, without actually being in Iva's mind and knowing exactly what she went through, I think that she really just kind of took every experience and every moment she had in the sake that she had no other choice, you know, and she resigned herself to the moment and was able to, but she, despite the resigning, she committed herself to who she was. And I think that that's the lesson that you should take from this uh, is that this is a person who knows who they are and despite all the odds, never gives up on themselves. And, uh, you know, Iva eventually would become vindicated, would receive a presidential pardon, um, would go on to receive and be declarated by the uh, Veterans Awards. Um, so, you know, this is somebody whose life was constantly in, in, in different arrays and going through things, but always knew who and what she was. And I think because of that knowledge of understanding who she was to herself, um, that's probably what kept her, you know, sane throughout all these years. I think but also the other aspect of uh, Eve's personality was she liked helping people. You know, um, I was looking through the book and this scene where she's helping prisoners of war with like bringing them soap, you know, so, some basic need that they needed, aspirins. And, you know, um, because she knew herself, she wanted, you know, that kindness to be shared. And, you know, how I see how she weathered it because a lot of people stood up to defend her. So she knew she was not alone. You know, all the people that worked together um, during the, the radio program, they came back to help. So I, I think she didn't feel isolated that way. You know, people were still reaching out and rooting for her. So that's really helpful because, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, you, you get confronted by racism, right? But then on the other hand, you'll meet people who are not. And, um, you know, the other side of self-worth has to be reflected from other people in the legal system. So, you know, you can't just will yourself self-worth. It's gotta be reflected. And it's not just particular to Asian people. It's like all people deserve respect and kindness. Okay. Yeah, and building off of that, I mean, I've always, I think, understood that there could and probably would be consequences in some way, but 
that should never stop you from, you know, really being yourself and, and knowing that you're doing the right thing. And it should never stop you from, from doing that thing if you have the power to do so. So yeah, she was unapologetically herself. And, and um, we definitely tried to show that in a lot of different ways in the book. Um, and being unapologetically yourself sometimes leads to leads to consequences that you don't, you know, that you don't think are fair, that no one thinks are fair, but ultimately she knows that what she did was right and that, you know, it'll come back around. And she had, like Janice mentioned, she had people that spoke up for her. She eventually did get pardoned, you know, and she, um, you know, she did still get to have access to her family, even, you know, in some ways, even if not in all the ways that she might have envisioned. So, um, so for her, I think that she still believes that what she did was right. And that's, that's really all that mattered. This is really like the definition of the truth will set you free is really, I was, I was a really good definition of that. So. You mentioned that she was not aware of the internment camps here in the United States. When did, when did she get a sense of how bad things were and how this was coming to get her? Do you think, I mean, sometimes you don't think things are really gonna go as badly as they, as they do. Well, I, I wanna say that I don't know the moment when she did become familiar with the internment camps. I don't think it was until she got back to the US because I don't think that from my research, she had any communication throughout the war um, or even immediately afterwards. So, uh, you know, her family originally had a grocery store in California. They were packed up and put in an internment camp. Um, unfortunately, her mother did not make it through. Um, and the family eventually relocated to Chicago, where, uh, you know, she opened up a shop and, and lived in for the remainders of her life. Um, so, but as far as the research, when she discovered what was going on in the U.S., I'm not quite familiar. Well, we got a very interesting question earlier that I want to jump to. Uh, one of our guests wants to know if you've gotten any new comments from World War II veterans after providing the new information in this project. Um, you know, I actually haven't spoken with any World War II veterans. Um, I, uh, my grandfather was a member of the 1st Division Marines. He was uh, at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked. Uh, and he went on the fight in almost every one of the major engagements in the Pacific uh, arena. So he was at Okinawa, he was at Guadalcanal, he was at Iwo Jima. Um, essentially, the Pacific HBO TV show was what he was living. Um, and I spoke, surprisingly, you know, I, I've heard of stories of a lot of, you know, World War II veterans not really wanting to talk about their experiences. But my grandfather told me many different stories that he went through at an age that I probably shouldn't have been listening um, but I, I credit him for being really my inspiration or, uh, or really my excitement and interest in uh, World War II history. And uh, he actually cameos in my graphic novel as uh, the officer that's leaving the church and then, you know, at the uh, Pearl Harbor when it gets attacked. So, um, but, you know, unfortunately, we don't have very many World War II veterans alive with us. Hey, we are getting to an age where my daughter who's only 16 months old, will never know anybody from World War II era. Um, but uh, again, my hope was to, you know, make this an approachable project and understand that even for people who are on both sides of this, you know, uh, combat field would appreciate, you know, learning the story and, and hearing it from this point of view. And almost, I mean, from most of my research, many of the American and allied troops really never had a negative or adverse effect to Tokyo Rose during her broadcast. Most of it was something that people tuned into for almost entertainment purposes. Yeah, yeah so, I would say that we've gotten a lot of specific like veteran commentary, but we have received, like I know that we did an, an event at a bookstore in Savannah and we met someone who actually had met Iva, mm -hmm. who like had lived in Chicago and like had shopped at her store and like was not really familiar with this whole story. And he came to that event just sort of by chance and was like, oh my gosh, what a small world. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people who sort of have a have this 
tangential awareness of you know this sort of propaganda story but we're not aware of the extent of it that have you know and fans of history and stuff that have talked to us at events we've gone to that have you know talked about how eye-opening it is to get this kind of perspective um especially through a graphic novel because i don't think a lot of people necessarily think of comics as like super educational, educational <laughs> or informative um you know or a place to sort of seek out stories from from history from you know from from very real life um so it's been really interesting to talk to a lot of people that you know have that perception and have that perception changed um by talking with us and and you know reading our book has it's it's been awesome what was her view on Japan after for the rest of her life? Did she have any feelings after her experiences there that she shared? Um, you know, most of the research I've done, she hasn't directly spoken to Japan in particular. She has actually spoken uh, in regards to people like, uh, you know, Major Tuneshi. Uh, or Suneshi and all the, you know, um, military, uh, Japanese military people that she worked with. And for the most part, um, again, it's really spoken to, uh, you know, Iva's uh, character in the sense that she does not hold any negative or adverse concerns or effects for them. You know, um, she understood that, you know, they were doing their job and was kind of neutral in that response, um, if not even somewhat pitying what they had to go through. But uh, there was never anything that I found that Iva ever had um, a soft spot for Japan or wanted to return to Japan or felt anger towards Japan or the situation. I mean, she definitely wasn't thrilled to be thrown in jail following it and have to defend herself. But at the end of the day, she held no guilt or no grudges against anybody. All right, here is a question. I wonder, now you've immersed yourselves in different ways in this propaganda story. Has this made any of you more aware or more alert to propaganda in the world around you? Has it made you paranoid? Uh, gotta ask. Oh, I'm already super suspicious all the time. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, but it definitely, you know, working on stories like this, even though it takes place in a very, very different time period than we're currently living in, it definitely makes you like think about the material that you're consuming both visually, you know, auditory and, uh, and sort of be like, huh. <laughs> It just it just gives you that extra sort of insight that 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 might just make you think a little bit harder about something sometimes. But again, I'm already kind of a suspicious person, I feel like. <laughs> well, we live in a world now where the news is definitely so subjective and people are having to, you know, question everything. And uh, regardless of wherever your political affiliations are or what your thoughts are out there, I think that we do live in a day and age where information is so readily available that we have a harder time knowing what is right and wrong or what is true and false. Uh, you know, I a time where, you know, that audio and that reporting was taken for factual information. So for one person to come out and speak, you know, even if, you know, allied troops were able to see through it, there was always a sense of some fact to it, which ultimately did lead to some of Iva's, um, you know, persecution coming back to bite her um, harder than others that, you know, uh, and today, comparatively, you know, we're in an age of visual um, misinformation, you know, artificial intelligence and how you can create visuals that aren't true. So I think we have to safeguard ourselves a little bit more today than, you know, than they did back then from. Yeah, I you don't think, uh, few platforms. I don't, I don't think fact check was part of the <laughs> vernacular right. then as much as it is now. Uh, yeah. Janice, you were saying. No, yeah, I said there's so many more platforms now. And, you know, uh, during Eva's time, it was more patriarchal. So there was less questioning about, like, is it true or false, or shall we follow the leader or not? So, you know, where there's opportunity, there's like miss opportunity also. So we all have to be critical thinkers and hopefully have a good moral compass to distinguish, you know, fact from fiction. 
and a lie a journalist lying to somebody that's not you know <laughs> like cheating for even from the money she needed to go home that's not that's not new news <laughs> yeah it's always been there <laughs> You know, we we have uh, we're always working on workshops, especially for youth audiences, to try to help uh, young people learn critical thinking skills. And I think we have I have some friends my own age that yeah. <laughs> probably could use some critical thinking skills. And you really you read it; it must be true. You you know so certainly the internet would never lie to me. No, it would never lie. And I always I'm an old time person. I read a newspaper and I say, now I know my newspaper has a bent, but I also say if I get everything digital, it's going to just give me what I want. If I read the newspaper. I will know about things in the world, even though it's going to have the, the bent that I have, I'm going to learn some other things that I don't already know about. Okay, here's my big softball question. <laughs> who, who, who's in the movie? Who should be in the movie? Who should play the part? <laughs> oh my gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> I feel like this is something Andre has probably thought about. <laughs> I have, and um, I, you know, it's it's tough for me because I actually haven't seen a lot of Jap. I mean, I know not saying that it's wrong, but I haven't seen a lot of Japanese American actresses lately that I would say like that's the person. Um, there was what was her name? Um, hold on one second. I'm trying to. I'm blanking on this, but she's not Japanese American. She's I think Korean English or Chinese English, but um, Jessica Henwick, who was in Iron Fist and she was also recently oh. in Black Onion. Yeah. And, like she's a really popular actress right now, but I would feel that for this kind of movie, like, again, I want a Japanese American actress for it. And I just can't think right now of anybody. I haven't gotten, so obviously for, you know, um, for cousins, we would want to pick, you know, the very, you know, very famous Hugh Jackman would be my my choice, <laughs> even though he doesn't look like it. You know, yeah. Well, doesn't, we'll, we'll, it it <laughs> we'll get him to sign on, and and yeah. then it'll it it will be I easy. Like this, so, I like this plan. Let's start a petition for everyone here to sign. <laughs> <laughs> all all right, and with our we just have a few moments, but um folks would like to know what are each of you working on right now if you're willing to share it or what's your coming up dream project <laughs> I, yeah I, I'm, I'm working on getting a few things uh out there but i can't really say much right now <laughs> unfortunately um I guess I'll go. I'm working on a graphic novel of IDW um, entitled We Are Pan. It's the uh, based off the true story of Operation Pedro Pan, which was a joint effort between the Catholic Welfare Bureau and the United States government to sneak 14,000 Cuban children out of Cuba. Um, I interviewed over a dozen um, Cubans uh, who are now living in America across the country. These were children who were ranging from, uh, you know, one, maybe even younger in age, all the way up to 17, who didn't go back to Cuba for fear of, you know, um, being indoctrinated into, Cuba, into co communism. Um, some of them went to family members. Some of them went to, uh, you know, perfect strangers as foster uh, children. Um, but like I said, I interviewed uh, over 12 different um, Pedro Pans, and the story is going to tell the uh, lead up and then the initiation of that operation. So that's due out um, sometime between 2024 and 2025. And I'm working with um, Yasmin uh, Flores Montanez, who's a uh, fantastic artist. She's actually working on um, uh, a DC comics as we speak. Well, Janice. I'm, I'm the lettering department for John and Sandy King Carpenter's Storm King Comics. So right now we're focusing on our ninth anthology, John Carpenter's Tales for a Halloween Night. And uh, there's like a, a lot of series going on for the Storm Kids line, the Tales of Science Fiction. We started a new series, Envoy, written by David Scow and um, Andres Esparza. 
So we have a lot of things going. And then at DC, I'm working on Spirit World as part of the Lazarus Planet um, storyline. And with uh, Scholastic, I'm working on the graphic novel interpretations of Lauren Tarsus's uh, historical um, novels. So, so far I lettered, uh, I survived Chicago fire, survived Nazi invasion. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, it's really fun. You know, it's like real page turner. You know, it's like, it's always a young person, you know, going through struggle, but everything ends up all right at the end. So it's like page 40, I start worrying. <laughs> And they start reading the script. It's like, phew, everything ends <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. You know, I'm honored to work with Scholastic because um, being the first generation born here, part of the simulation process is to master the language. So I remember the Scholastic book fairs and what a big deal it was. You know, it's like you can, you can create your own library for 25 cents a book. So every time when you got the flyer, you would mark off, you know, the books you were going to buy at the fair. So I feel so happy that I can give back and be part of the team to create new books to the book fairs. <laughs> book, book fair is so special to to all that. When when my son had book fair at school, I just felt like oh, it's all the good holidays rolled into one. I have a late breaking <laughs> comment from um, my beloved colleague Hannah Sloyo, who wants to throw out Aquafina. For um, for Eva, even though she's not Japanese. I'm sorry about Okafina. <laughs> yeah, but she's got a great personality too, and I think for the she, and she's got a really unique voice. So you know. Oh, that's that, true. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to share that before we before we disappeared, <laughs> and I want to I want to tell everyone, please, we'll we'll send you how to how to get a hold of this graphic novel if you haven't gotten it already it it's such an interesting read and it's it's an important read and it's it's been such a pleasure to spend this evening with you creators it was it was amazing and i want to thank the pritzker foundation for supporting this program and for our wonderful friends at the pritzker uh, museum and library in chicago where Eva settled for Iva. I think I butchered your name, so forgive me for that. It's been a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you guys so much. Take good care. Thank yes, you. Thank you so too. Much. Thanks. <laughs> Goodbye.